Good morning to you, my friends, wherever you may be in the world today, May 22nd, 2021, here from Santa Monica, Alan Clements, California, United States of America. I uh, hope you're doing well today, finding yourself in heart, embodied in the most elegant, peaceful, heart-centric way. Another precious hour, precious minute to commune with the best of ourselves, with our family, our friends, our Buddha, our goddess, our gods, our Jesus, our Allah, our truth, our democracy, our freedom, our empathy, our compassion for the good people fighting the good fight around the world, of Myanmar today especially. Yet again, another courageous day to confront the evil of evil personified by this institution known as the former military in Burma, MASAC, the acronym for Burma's Taliban. And here we sit, here we breathe. Uh, today's talk, uh, a challenging day, a challenging yesterday. Um, Dhamma, a deep vibrational word for me. Uh, the psychic the psychic transformation, if you will, of, of limiting visions of self and other in the world. I use the word psychic to indicate uh, the radiance of a meditator. I would say someone, a girl, a boy, a nun, a monk. Um, someone devoted to the beauty and the power and the radiance of sati, uh, the deep ability to feel the nature of phenomena as it is. A taste is a taste, a sight is a sight, a sound as a sound, a sensation as a sensation, a thought as a thought, but, but much more than just a, a concept the, the psychic interface of, of the quality of sati, of mindfulness, and the intelligence brought forth within that psychic texture that sees reality in its intimacies and according to its unique and common characteristics. Uh, the mind of a meditator, for me, is essentially the journey of the psychic intuitive. I don't particularly mean here the clairvoyant or the telepathic or the extraordinary or the supra mundane specifically, but a heightened ongoing elevating sensitivity to vibrational reality. I feel not to get overly psychedelicized or quantum reality-sized, reality uh, but the, the nature of being, from my humble opinion, today as I sit and breathe, is a set of intersecting ecosystems of vibrational intelligences that if we can coordinate, all relatively speaking, with harmonious, non-limiting narratives, we find within that psychic intuitive radiance, that awareness, a liberating process, a liberation from constricting forces of consciousness, shame, blame, worry, doubt, restlessness, impatience, hatred, anger, judgment, vilification, all the various ways in which we scapegoat self and other, and not really with the psychic intuitive sati lens of deep, intimate, awakening to that state of mind called scapegoating, blame, judgment, the propaganda of projection that, that takes consciousness away from its own environment and believes the propaganda of the function of the lie to blame other for what one is feeling, which is a very adequate response. But in terms of the psychic intuitive journey of overcoming limiting visions, this deep 
what I feel to be self-responsibility to deke effects from primitive narratives and propaganda of blame and judgment and scapegoating and projection and transference and all the psychological terms and political terms and all the ways in which we, we exonerate ourselves from responsibility and place the onus on other. That, that propaganda, that fiction, that limiting vision. And that's a very beautiful journey. And I call it, you know, nothing original, but the word Dhamma in Pali Buddhist and the word Dharma in Indian Sanskrit. Uh, those two words, transcending culture and location, to me, point to, in my direct experience, the psychic awakening of the power of sati or mindfulness to interface with liberating visions rather than limiting visions of being. A limiting vision would be totalitarianism, dictatorship, xenophobia, apartheid, discrimination, racism, hatred, blame, all the ways in which we violate existence in the name of a limited, an unlim unlimited vision would be coexistence, co-creation, shared space, elegant, ubuntified, bodhisattvic elevation through the journey of, of, of kindness, of decency, of dignity, the elevation of other through the preoccupation of giving through love, compassion, wisdom, um, all those particular states of mind, if felt through the powerful psychic intuitive lens of sati or mindful intelligence, one begins to see the distinction of a self-created world in which one inhabits harmony and unity inside of oneself, the meditator knows this, and begins to overcome the deep invenerating projections primordially situated within mind. Why they're there, I don't know, but they're there. And we decathex, we pull back from, we release grasping, clinging, and make the journey of non-attachment, the journey of mindful intelligence, so that we reclaim the ways in which we inhabit self-generated suffering. And we overcome those projections by taking more responsibility within our own mind to see them as mind creations. A very delicate conversation, but if you can bear with me today in this, again, this, this spontaneous sharing of Dhamma, uh, the psychic intuitive journey of overcoming limiting visions. Uh, on a personal note, yesterday was extremely challenging for me, one of the more challenging days since the diagnoses back on April 11th with this acutely enlarged ascending aorta aneurysm, the largest vessel in the human body leaving the heart. And the diagnoses of... of of a very complicated surgery, which I've been looking into every day, challenging as it is, a very complicating, complicated surgery, or, or the risk of what they call dissection, which is the fraying of the aorta, the largest vessel from the heart, uh, and or the full rupture of it, which is just the breaking of that, that vessel. And um, so either way, to continually examine the data, the information, the surgeons, the surgeons, the nurses, uh, the cardiac assistants, just been a purposeful chosen journey to look into this condition because it's clearly, as I've been told in what I read, uh, life-threatening, either way, either through surgery or non-surgery. Um, and I was reflecting on my conversation with one of the cardiac surgeons, 
and asking him about, it's tied into this very topic of Dhamma and the psychic intuitive, about the, the challenges of undergoing open heart surgery to so-called repair this aorta aneurysm. And he said they're, they're extremely complicated. It's a long process, six, eight, 10 hours, eight, nine, 10, 12 people, uh, open heart surgery, you're on a lung heart machine, there's a 40 minute period in which you're, you're clinically dead. Um, you're, and it's done many times around the world and it's done successfully. However, there are complications. And he cited this example, I didn't know this particular man, uh, Bill Paxton, and I looked him up finally yesterday and uh, he had mentioned that he was a, a renowned Hollywood actor. And, but I didn't investigate it, but I looked into it yesterday and saw that Bill Paxton, in fact, is a renowned Hollywood actor. He is now deceased. This is the example given to me when asked about the complications of this, this uh, surgery for the enlarged ascending aorta aneurysm. Bill Paxton, uh, was the, an actor in Apollo 13. He was an actor in the Titanic, uh, Big Love, numerous, numerous films. And here he was diagnosed with the identical condition that I have, according to what the surgeon was telling me and what I was reading also yesterday, numerous articles about it. In fact, he had a and a, an ascending aorta that was smaller than the one that they've discovered in my chest. And he chose to undergo the surgery here at Cedars Sinai with a renowned cardiac surgeon. And uh, it didn't turn out so well. I mean, uh, 11 days later, he died in hospital of a stroke. And I read some of the fine print that was on the internet about the whole circumstance and the serendipity of that discovery led to how the family had entered a lawsuit with Cedar sinai for malpractice and not really letting the family and Bill Paxton know of truly the complications of the surgery. That was the main point that the surgeon was trying to make to me and also what the family in their lawsuit were trying to make the claim to the courts and to the world that the information on complication wasn't adequately explained. So I've been looking into that yesterday. It was very alarming, very difficult to to go to the Aorta Dissection Foundation's website, uh, watch videos of men and women who have survived the dissection of the aorta and, and or the rupture, who were in that small percentage of people that survived dissection and rupture. And they give these very profound video testimonies that are extremely alarming in how graphic the emotions are of, of the circumstance, the pain, the, the challenge of recovery, post-recovery, the weeks and the months and the years after recovery, um, recurring issues, I mean, they're very frank about this. It's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm feeling the intensity of the emotionality around this. And I'm trying to really bring my Dhamma and my, how would I say it? My psychic, intuitive, sati, my mindfully intelligent presence to feel. Feeling is the, the first place I go to in Dhamma as an action of, of being is to feel the reality of something without the fear of it being a problem. If there's fear or if there's anger or if there's shame or if there's doubt or if there's contraction, even if there's hope 
or if there's kindness and patience and love and compassion or even insight just to, to, to stay in fidelity without the race to something else or to make any kind of quick conclusions about something so you can get into a deeper narrative, if you will. And so I continued to do this meditatively. I had to do some breathing, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of walking, a little bit of relaxing to re-enter these videos and these testimonies of surgeons and doctors and conferences and testimonies of the survivors and about Bill Paxton. And I went down the avenue of like, stroke seems to be a big complication uh, from this type of surgery, blood clotting and stroke. And, and I found some information and testimonies on how some surgeons, whether it's through cognitive dissonance, um, not really being able to grasp the desire to support and save a patient versus the reality of the complications of possibly having this individual die in your own hands. And that must be a very complicated thing for a team of surgeons and nurses to enact that confidently and to, to really level with you on what you're encountering, what you will encounter. Because we none of us know our hands of God. And it's just so crazy to be thinking in these terms. And I'm just descending into a sense of, oh my God, like a prediction of, of, of high existential fatigue to the point where I'm feeling like I'm my whole chest is collapsing with a type of self-induced fear and I had to really stop again but I needed the information and the surgeon told me to really do the research and to look for yourself because it's your mind your family your body your friends your your heart you're the one who has to ultimately make the choice of when and how and with whom and dizzying even to pack my bags at the moment even to write a note to myself or a text uh, so there is this sense of overwhelm and here I am trying to navigate my Dhamma within this and thank you for supporting such a personal sharing today but I don't know where else to go other than the Dhamma of the personal in the existential it's just the way in which my mind operates within context it's always personal and it's always existential. It's always psychological. It's always intimate. If we so choose to make Dhamma the priority of our psychic intuitive mindful presence to what is it? What are the definitions? What are the, the first attributes of your Dharma, your Dhamma? And for me, it's so clearly decathexing from the primordial in venerating attachments and grasping to degenerative narratives of fear, anger, conflict, greed, but not to immediately to invest in their opposites, but just to patiently feel and relax the, the tension around dissonant states of mind and without filling it in with their opposites, just to feel in that limit, limiting view the limitless nature of openness without the need for another narrative. Just openness, pure mystery. And therein lies a type of, what will be the word for me right now? A gladdening of spirit, a lightness of spirit. And so I'm just, I guess what I'm pointing to here for myself to really realize what I'm saying is that in the investigation of life, there is the journey of our Dhamma that is parallel to the narratives of our thought, our reactions, our emotions, our rent, our bills, our love, our intimacies, our health. But none of those things lead to the edification of immortality or of enlightenment alone. They just are the, the splendor of the suburb of psychology. We get to manipulate and play. If you live in the real time of a democracy, there's some freedom. But if you're in a totalitarian jungle or a gulag being tortured, there's very little freedom there. So the Dhamma is always something that's available to overcome limiting views. And for me, the Dhamma is the play of the psychic, intuitive intimacy of pure feeling and allowing open space to be naked in the face of the world without filling it in with positive opposites of fear, just to feel. <clears throat> so
So I spoke to my dear friend last night, Janine, and wanting to just, I guess, process in sacred time with someone who is just the safest of individuals in my life and to hear and to feel and to explore and navigate a very, very complex terrain that's going on right now that's equally complicated by the unthinkable, for me, the, the deep, I use this word strongly but accurately, the, the deep horror of my family in Burma. I can't even imagine the comparison I can imagine how intimately difficult it is for the people of Burma with the families and the fathers and the sisters and the nuns and the monks and the leaders that have been elected who have been jailed, tortured, the grieving of the dead, the, the unthinkable mockery of justice with this, 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 this guy, this satanic cult leader, this, this Boko Haram creep, Ming Online, at the top of this military unit, high-fiving it with Xi Jinping and China and Putin and other arms dealers and oil magnet tycoons around the world, Chevron, Total Oil Company, banking conglomerates. These men and women who own these corporate satanic cults, all high-fiving and masturbating together, in the mockery of justice and rule of law and, and parading beloved Da Aung San Suu Kyi, a radically wise, meditating, sensitive mother, leader, savant of the heart, one of the great expressions of radiant nonviolent divinity in action against totalitarian military, testosterone, violent, driven, primarily dictatorial men. Yes, they're all married, and there's some women too that are married to men. And the mockery on this stage set called Planet Earth of parading her before a military tribunal with these unthinkably ridiculous crimes, as if a trial is really real, where she'll likely spend the rest of her years or even months in a prison in Rangoon. And I'm going like, juxtaposing that with my own acutely enlarged ascending aorta aneurysm and surgery and the risk of that and Bill Paxton, Hollywood actor, lawsuits of not really explaining the lethality and the complications of the surgery, dying of stroke, watching videos and testimonies of men and women who out of the blue are talking and sitting and they, they contract with this incredibly searing pain. They didn't even know they had an aorta aneurysm. And they're taken for whatever reason because family doesn't know what's going on and they're taken to ER and they're diagnosed and misdiagnosed and 90% of them die and the other few percent live on to give video testimonies and video testimonies and it's like, wow, that is like really intense information to be navigating into this playing field and the, the really bigger issue in the last third of the sharing today that came home to me was the issue of what do you really want for yourself right now rather than the right or wrong of action or non-action, not to vilify non-action, but it's a very problematic discovery of what to do with whom and when. Not an easy navigation, and I'm pretty skilled at navigating information, but my heart is looking for a sense of home. That's the overarching word. And it's not as convenient as some place that's secure alone. Yes, that too. A citadel against the corruptions of God and Satan, of good and bad, right and wrong. Yes, some place that is beyond form, 
that includes form but is not violated by the 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 jagged actions of consciousness embodied either in the planetary system, the ecosystem, the animal world, or the human world, where all these violations that are going on, like in Burma with the Aung San Suu Kyi and the people and torture and violence and the horrors around the world and the gulags and the prisons and the labor camps and the subjugation of men and women and torturous conditions of sexual violence and 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 human trafficking and how many have been lost, the names, the addresses, the tears of those who've been exterminated in the name of an ideology. I can barely even talk about what I've learned a little bit about Dachau or Auschwitz or in Cambodia's Pol Pot. All those people, those names, those names of people. And I'm thinking within all of this, home. And I'm trying to reflect on when, when have I felt at home, really at home. Yes, those moments of pure splendor and intimacy and joy where we're riding high on the, the, the warm waves of kindness and shared space and laughter and play and satire, the success of a book or a show or a comment or a quiet drink together and we just toast to our shared love over many decades of time. The tears, of course, of people that we've loved that pass, the loss, the separations, the poignancies of this play of life on the stage set of planet Earth in this cosmos. Home. I want home. Home to me in ways are synonymous with Nibbana, the unconditioned, trans shakable. occupation of peace <laughs> beyond surgery so unpractical in so many ways but I guess that's what happens when we meditate over the years and we sensitize through diet and love and peace and nature and yoga and love and kindness and quietude of the soul getting really, really, really quiet inside. That psychic intuitive sense of just feeling home. And I thought to myself as I conclude today, when have I truly felt at home? And I was thinking in my morning walk Of, of my time as a Buddhist monk in Burma after about the first year I became quite ill and through the unexplainable set of circumstances I found myself in my room in the Yekta, the monastery, um, having been uh, in surgery for the removal of, um, for a procedure that, and uh, it became complicated. I hadn't really thought about it in detail for a long time. This is back in 1980. It's that 40, 40 years ago. And it was complicated. And my leg became swollen. And the veins became like deep rivers of dark red. And I was weakened. I had, I came down with 
hepatitis at the same time and a number of other ailments. And they didn't want to bring me to the hospital. They thought that the best place would bring the hospital to me. And they turned my room in the monastery into a hospital room where the surgeon, one of the best in the country, who operated on me said it was just an unfortunate circumstance and I can only beg of your understanding, but the operation was not successful and we must amputate your leg to save your life. And I remember that day of having to integrate something so catastrophic as being handicapped the rest of my life like that, being in a wheelchair, crutches, or prosthesis, and it just didn't fit the narrative of my existence. Any more than reflecting upon Bill Paxton dying of stroke or listening to these testimonies of people who have survived rupture and dissection. Some of them go as far as to say they wish they hadn't. Uh, they're seriously disabled, juxtaposed with the vast majority of them dead, that died either at home, wherever they were when it happened. And I'm thinking here today, like, you know, I, I really shouldn't drive anymore. I really shouldn't fly anymore because that could happen at any moment. And it's like, my God. And so it's, it's, I'm acquainting myself more with information and lifestyle changes. And I, I saw in one of the testimonies how someone feels that the most characteristic in the support groups of people with an aorta aneurysm is a sense of hopelessness. And I could easily see how that state of mind could occupy my being. So I had to be very vigilant in this process yesterday and today to not allow that texture to, to root in my own hard-earned sense of identity and peace over these decades. Very vigilant there to psychically, intuitively be present without the limiting narrative vision of, of hopelessness. It's such a strong word. What does it even point to on a, on a, on a membranic level? and to study the intelligence of that narrative so that it doesn't congeal. And the vigilance right now to be in Burma and here with so many conflicting possibilities of complexity and suffering and struggle and despair, the pandemic, the depression I feel that I'm in, semi-depression that everyone's in, where to go, how to go, vaccines, with whom, how to spend, how to acquire, what to do, where's their joy, with a mask, without a mask, with a vaccine, without a vaccine, wanting to touch, wanting to love, without dying. I mean, I want to be, I don't want to. It's so many things here in this, this, this Dhamma and the, the ongoing journey of the psychic intuitive presence within inner and outer being and dissolving as much as intimately possible limiting visions of self and world. And so as I try to understand and navigate my own decision-making process within form, it's, I find myself the overarching process is the application of experiential Dhamma so much more and so equally simple as the heart and the mind and the art of a meditator, a, a yogi, a dhamma practitioner, and a being embodying timeless, limitless processes of freedom. So I'm in my room in Burma, 1980, and the room has turned into a hospital room, and I'm on an IV, and I, with the hepatitis and the infections and the heavy-duty antibiotics, I, I said, no, please, under no circumstance, sever my leg. 
do everything imaginable. The people from the United States Embassy came and said, we'll fly you to Bangkok. And I remember telling them that this is, this is my home. I was all but 29, out of America, not even able to speak the language. I'm not even sure there were any other Westerners around at the time. I'm saying, this is my home. And I'm thinking yesterday and today, why, why did I say that? What was about that space in that level of complexity that I could call home? And because right now, that's, that's, I want a safe haven. That, I mean, I guess, don't we all want that? In form, in companionship, in, in self-respect, the luxury of having those concentric experiences of refuge, just a pure physical, emotional, psychological, and equally existential, nibbonic, simultaneous feeling of not too much to ask in this world of crazy, outrageous violence and catastrophe. So there's a sense of not wanting to belong at the same time of wanting to occupy more fully that which I do want to engage. Is it metaphorical? Is it physical? What is it when I meditate? What is it when I do yoga? What is it when I'm speaking right now? Where is that feeling of home? Is it an integrity, in the sense of dignity, a sense of trans-limiting beliefs that no matter what happens, old age, disease, death, time, location, are all narratives within this, this great, transparent sky called samsara hold on to me and you will suffer and i'm thinking yes that's what it is i felt safe i felt now go deeper i said to myself it felt safe and sacred i remember my teacher at the time say to upandita coming to visit unlike me visiting him in his cottage, the honor of having him come to my room. And he brought with him people that would serve me for the coming months. I didn't know them. They were all students and devotees of his. And as the days and the weeks and the months went on, it was quite a struggle to have these infinitely intimate, perfect strangers. You know how when you meet people, in the sacred safety of that Dhamma place that you both share, that communion, right? Reverential communion with these psychic, psychic intuitive interplay of transformational energy. It's, it's post-psychedelic, it's trans-psychedelic. That's too ordinary where you've got to ingest to feel. But the meditator, the yogi, knows that you can consciously engage slow ingestion of the meditative psychically space where you all of a sudden inhabit that beautification field, right? So I began to meditate more, even though I couldn't move in my bed. And the people in the room, I couldn't even talk. They would chant, they would wipe my brow, they would wipe my face, they would put cold water on my lips, it was such a beautiful experience as I was so-called dying and healing simultaneously, choosing to occupy home in the radiant psychic intuitive of a very challenged body. But to find this heightened awakening, if you will, of the psychic intuitive shared space of transformational, liberating awakening. They're bringing their heightened Dhamma 
I'm bringing my best Dhamma. Together we're bringing a Dhamma that exceeds the individual Dhamma. And all of a sudden we're living Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. And all of a sudden we're living in the kind of Nibbana field of overcoming conditions and limiting visions of health and normality. Home. I am in my Dhamma home because it's a Dhamma event. And what a gift that is to feel that safe. And I'm just bringing that historic memory into the present right now. And it's vitalizing me because I feel that I really am looking for that level of recreation, not just for the event of the Dhamma and the awakening of the Dhamma, but as, the, as my heart's desire, if you will, for optimal conditions for healing. I don't think I've ever felt so comfortable in my life as I was there on that bed in that room during that year of not wanting to be anywhere else, anywhere else, home. <laughs> it's so simple. You know, when you're meditating and you're in that love-making region of silence and passion and ease and you're not anticipating the future or the next or the meal or the job or the work or the agenda, you really are beyond form and time, but yet you don't exclude those dynamics. Bill Paxton died in the hospital, Cedar sinai Tens of thousands of people, according to the data, die of this condition. Others undertake surgery, they heal and they're so-called temporarily restored. I'd like to know that I'm at home, not just in heart, symbolically, but in order to undergo the complexities of this thing for me, this is really a very personal sharing, I feel that it's important to create a sacred sense of being held. You can't do it alone, Alan. You can't just get on a plane and fly. You can't just do this alone. You are right back as you were in 1980 in the Mahasi Yegda in Rangoon, Burma. You would not be alive without the hand and the heart and the energy of these good people in this shared dynamic that you called home against all odds. You said to the embassy people, no, I don't want to leave here. I don't want to return to America. I don't want to go to Bangkok. I don't want to go to Singapore. I'd rather die at home than to leave this sacred space. That's really coming home, right? And what a luxury that is to even say that, much less feel that, but the conditions were very ferocious. I could go on and on about this and what it meant to interrelate silently and psychically with the lovemaking dance of Dana. People you don't even know serving your safety, your well-being, your heart, your mind, your body. The role of the doctor, the nurse, the savant, the, the fellow sister, brother, that just sees the sanctity of shared space, kisses it, touches it, caresses it, brushes it, washes it, being taken from my bed and cleaned and bathed it was a remarkably vulnerable experience. I was so into my kind of feminine, masculine, sitting, walking meditation, the autonomy of being in my own being, watching my breath, watching my mind, another day in the life of meditation and walking and the evolution of Dhamma, 
with the aspiration of Nibbana, and all of a sudden illness strikes, catastrophic illness, and you can't move, and now you're in the unoptionable, unoptionable company of other to live, survive, and to breathe and to be held. And what will you do with that? And that's what the invitation to surgery is going to be about. That's what the invitation to waiting and seeing the vulnerability of what could happen. I now need other. Burma is everywhere where I must go now. I must create that level of family, those hands, those hearts, that home. And it's coming clear to me that the highest priority is to feel safe in order to feel and then order to decide and in order to potentially heal even without surgery. In retrospect, that surgery in Burma was a mistake. And it took a long, long time of suffering through that. As elegant and as inspiring as it was, it was so uber challenging, it was mind boggling. But through the grace of the Dhamma, the goodness of my own teachers and these family friends, stranger, they introduced me to this concept of, of just shared Dhamma space. You can't live alone. You can't be alone. We need each other. And here I'm going to be soon in that epic need, which right now is becoming all the more evident. And blessed are the few people close to me that I am choosing to interact with daily in order to not just survive, but to elevate this, this sense of Dhamma together in this psychic intuitive transformational journey of overcoming, overcoming, limiting limits, limiting beliefs. Clearly, I, I made it through that period in Burma. Some months after I was walking again, kept my leg. I was so, so happy to be in energy again, post hepatitis, post typhoid, post catastrophic infection. You know how it is when you have eaten a good meal, you've fallen in love, whatever it is that gives you that buoyancy that puts you from human to transcendental. And now your views are exceeding everything limiting and you're back to high human normal. And everything is radiant with goodness and joy and possibility. See, I don't, I don't personally fear death at all because I do believe in rebirth, both here and now, over and over and higher and higher, and also dimensionality. I have seen in my meditation and my psychic explorations and my psychedelic explorations, multidimensionality, deity engagement, uh, intersubjective conversational heightened intuitive sharings. I, I know that to be intimately, psychically factual. And I equally know the wisdom of investing in causality, 
Dhamma constituents of heightened causality that lead to more radiant expressions of trans-limiting emotions. I do believe in the spectrum of Dhamma radiance, from limits to unlimited possibilities. Within that, I intuitively, psychically feel that I'm not going to place all of my investment in the psychic, intuitive, multidimensional, transhuman, next life experience. I will give life to the human, as I will today, as you will today, to nutrient and liquid and hydration and sleep. But I want to be smart this time, really, really smart and understand the constituents of what I would call Dhamma home, physical home, and safety and refuge. I'm really looking where that is. Yes, it is here and now, but also I'm looking for the soon after the now, soon, soon, where I can stop and situate and and feel into the sanctity of life as retreat, life as mystical event, life as heightened Dhamma presence, and to see what that gift of mind purity does to influence bodily biological functions, and perhaps there's even the miracle of where this aorta aneurysm returns to some normalcy. I do believe in the power of the mind and the heart and the psychic intuitive to influence physicality and shared space inside and outside. Well, as I walked on months after my healing in Burma, I'll end here. Uh, I was walking on water. I was so happy. And I heard from behind me um, someone calling out my name. Uegasara, like that. And I was going somewhere. I didn't want to be interrupted. Months before, I was in my room on my bed, possibly dying, unable to walk. There was no place to go. I was intimately connected to home and refuge in the radiance of that shared space. A few months later, the narrative dissolved back into the more ordinary Alan, and I was going somewhere again. And someone was asking me to stop going somewhere. And I was a monk in a monastery. And I asked myself, why would someone be asking me to stop? It's a silent monastery. You don't speak to people from behind. All the protocols of respectful narratives. He said it again. And I stopped and I turned and with this very subtle sense of pride, I looked and made heart eye contact with him and asked, what is it in my fledgling Burmese with a very slight tone of please tell me quickly so that I can go on with my chosen destination. It was anything but the Dhamma of the psychic, psychic intuitive and overcoming limiting visions. He looked and I looked and therein lies. He, he just entered my being with this radiant smile. I didn't know who it was. And I was postured, he was naked, as I assumed in retrospect. And he asked me in Burmese, do you remember me? And I, I said, no, I don't. 
he said in simple language, so unpretentious, so beautifully transparent. I was one of the people that took care of you when you were dying. No name, no accolades, no endorsements, no applause. And then he looked at me and I was vulnerable with awe, opening again to a heart-centric sense of connectivity to the space I'm in, overcoming the limiting beliefs of future and past and fear and death and disease, just pure being at home right now where you are. And he said, I'm so happy to see you walking again. I'm so happy to see you healthy. So many lessons in this sharing as I hear it in myself. The overarching insight for me is the multiplicity of coming home, taking refuge in my Dhamma, in the sanctity of my psychic intuitive interrelatedness with loving kindness, with compassion, with patience, with insight, with unconditionality of giving over to the presence of self with self, self with other, and there in that combination of shared Dhamma, the Ubuntification, the Bodhisattvic shared awakening of growing into heightened levels of freedom together beyond form, beyond age, beyond disease, beyond death. It's as if you're finding your most elegant existential lover in the face of disease and death itself. That's why I use right now, I've been invited to dance with the angel of death, as you have, as we all have, based on being born. All of us are in this together. What will we do with the preciousness of who we are, where we are. And the coming home process to me is in my experiential relationship to the Dhamma. There I cannot die. There I cannot compromise. There is unlimited possibility in rebirthing there, regardless of the outcome of surgery or no surgery or any other form of complexity that arises as humans on this planet. So from my heart to yours, thank you for being in my life. Thank you for participating in this journey. And I uh, hope you have a beautiful day. And I hope to see you tomorrow uh, at this time, 9.30 here, Pacific uh, time in California. Have a great day. Thank you.